take our, well, you see this, uh, Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whosoever thou goest. the Lord and he heard me. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them. higher than 
scriptures you sang tonight uh, let me see here one oh, come back here no 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 oh my well you sang a bunch <laughs> just put it that way well take your bibles if you would and let's turn to the passage in first kings chapter number 17 first kings chapter 17 well, I, I don't always do a uh, point for Wednesday night, but I wanted you to just see a couple things tonight. So, uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 7. 1 Kings 17, 1 through 7. I like this part of the scripture, like when Elijah gets involved. 
Elijah, Elisha, these are great characters in the Old Testament. They just kind of, they just come on the scene when Israel is just at a low ebb. I mean, just terrible. I mean, you just get discouraged looking at some of the things that Israel does and the kings of Israel are doing. And then you see Elijah and Elisha show up on the scene. You go, yes. You know, you see some of the things that they say and see some of the responses. And I don't know, it's an exciting, it brings excitement out of what would ordinarily be very depressing. But nonetheless, the Elijah, and Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. Verse 7 says, And it came to pass, after a while, that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. Well, let's have a word of prayer and ask the Spirit of God to help us as we look here at the story of Elijah at the brook Cherith. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we Look at this passage, glean a little bit from what it has to offer. Trust that you'd speak to our hearts, help us to perhaps in some way, somehow put our feet back in the shoes of Elijah. Think about some of the things that he experienced. Lord, realize that you were orchestrating all of this for a very good reason. I pray, God, that you would help us all to realize that even the things that we experience, things that aren't so pleasant, that have purpose, and purposes need to be achieved, and sometimes it takes time to see them achieved. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to realize this as we go through some of the difficulties we go through. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we read stories about the miracles that Elijah performed in it make for some pretty exciting reading. I don't know about you. I like to see Elijah out there. We're not going to see it here, but in the chapters following, you see Elijah on Mount Carmel calling down fire from heaven, you know, and you see uh, the mighty deeds of Elijah. It's pretty exciting. And uh, uh, I wonder how many of you would like to be able to call down fire from heaven and like say the word and then the rain stops. How many of you like to have that kind of yeah, wow, I'll tell you, that's pretty neat to think about. Boy, you say the thing, and it happens in just cataclysmic form, and then that's amazing. But I have to ask you another question. How many of you would like to live with the consequences of those pronouncements? You see, for you to say, no rain, you say, Boy, that'll show them. Well, guess what? That's not the only one that's going to show. Sometimes you have to live with your pronouncements, your own pronouncements. And that's kind of what I'd like to look at tonight. And that is Elijah. Yeah, he made a mighty pronouncement. Tells us over in James, you know, he was just kind of a regular guy. But yet, you know, he had power with God. He prayed and it didn't rain. Prayed again and it rained. And, and yet... You know who had to live with the consequences of those, uh, those uh, pronouncements? Not just, not just Ahab, not just Israel. Elijah had to live with that as well. And so uh, so um, our story takes us to a very sad time in Israel's history. You know, um, I want you, if you're in chapter 17, just turn back a chapter to chapter 16. I'm going to look at the last part here. In verses 29, uh, this is Ahab. Okay, so Ahab is now the king in Israel. 
Israel has had a succession of some pretty poor kings. I mean, Zimri came in and he took and he assassinated the ruler that was before him. He ruled about seven days. Amri comes in. He whacks away on, Zim, on Zimri. So he's gone now. Amri was wicked in the sight of the Lord. And then Amri has a kid. His name is Ahab. All right. So we got, you know, father, great grandfather. I mean, these are not such a great, you know, they're all pretty steeped in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And it was a pretty sad case. But so we read here. We've had all these succession of bad kings. Here's what happened, okay? Solomon made some pretty poor mistakes, married a lot of women, and as a result, they turned his heart away from God. God rent the kingdom from him. And so what God did is he get two tribes, okay? Judah and Benjamin, okay? You guys, you're the two tribes. And then all the rest of the ten tribes, those ten tribes, they uh, went to Jeroboam. And Jeroboam took them, and basically Jeroboam didn't want them to go back to Judah and worship. So he set up his own form of worship up in Samaria, and they worshiped Baal. And uh, so as a result of that, uh, children of Israel go downhill, downhill, downhill. And God, you know, it was just one king after another, making one poor choice after another. But they kept on going further and further away from God. Until we arrive at Ahab. And Ahab was certainly uh, not the best. He was probably one of the worst. And in the 38th year of Asa, the king of Judah. Now, Asa is a good king. All right. But in his 38th year, I think he reigned 41 years altogether. So at the end of his reign, all right, the last three years of his reign, who comes to reign but uh, Ahab, the son of Amri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Amri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 20 and 2 years. Oh, my goodness. They didn't have term limitations there, did they? 20 and 2 years. And Ahab, the son of Amad, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Now, if you read what the other kings before him did, you talk about Jeremiah, Zimri, Amri, all these different kings here, you're going, whoa, these guys were terrible. Well, Ahab is worse than all of them. That's a pretty sad commentary when you think about it. And it came to pass that as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, of the son of Nebat. Okay, we look at the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. It was kind of like the standard of bad, okay? It was like a light thing. It was like saying, man, <laughs> that was nothing compared to what Ahab did. And so we're talking about some pretty serious times in Israel's history right here. That he took a wife, Jezebel. Oh, my goodness. You think Ahab was bad. Now he's got a wife worse than him, Jezebel. Oh, my soul. And Jezebel was the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of the Zidonians. And they went and served Baal and worshipped him. So they were all out, I guess you could say. I wouldn't want to say all in. But they're all out. I mean, they're just completely, completely crazy about not serving God. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. So this is the condition. This is the last, the last verses here of chapter 16 before we get to our passage here in chapter 17. So Elisha, Elijah I should say, has, um, he decides, he didn't decide, uh, he actually got helped him in this whole thing here. So this is what's happening here. Israel divided from Judah. Israel's taken some very wicked kings. Ahab was a king, very wicked. And uh, this was the reason for the drought that was come upon Israel. Listen, folks, national calamities do not come without cause. Let me say that again. National calamities do not come without cause. Now, that is not a popular statement. That is not something that the news will tell you. As a matter of fact, if anybody says stuff like that, you will probably be chastised for it, okay? Now, what gives, Pastor, what makes you say that? Proverbs chapter 6, 26, verse 2 makes me say that. It's not my idea. Listen to what it says. As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, by the way, that's how they get around, okay? It says, so the curse causeless shall not come. Okay? The bird gets around by flying. The swallow flies because God gave it to wings to fly. It didn't have any wings. It wouldn't be flying. God made it to do that. And he's saying just like those birds get around by flying and those birds by wandering, he says the curse causeless shall not come. 
You and I can't fly like this. Birds can. God has made them that way. And curses come because there are conditions. There are conditions present for curses to take place. And so God's never pleased with wickedness. God is never pleased with wickedness. He wasn't pleased with the wickedness that was taking place prior to some of the things we're seeing today. He's certainly not pleased with the wickedness that has taken place as a result of what we have seen. And so we have to understand that. He allows national disasters like drought, like famine, like pestilence, like wars to get our attention. And what does God want to do in all this? He wants, this to, he wants these things to bring us back to Him. That's what God wants. You know, people think, oh, God just hates... No, 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 no. God hates wickedness. But God wants to bring His people... He wants His, pe he wants his people to be restored. That's what God wants. God wants restoration. He wants us to repent and be restored in fellowship. Okay, let's talk about where all this stuff took place, all right? Because um, I got some things here that I think might help. Because, you know, you talk about this. All right, well, where was the setting for all this? Okay, let's see here. Uh, you got that picture. I want you to have the bigger picture here. Nope, not that one. All right. So, can you see this? All right. So, all right. Here is the Sea of Galilee right here, okay? And here's the Jordan the River, comes right down right here. And right at this little point right here, this here is the Brook Cherith, right here. It's a little thing that comes right off of the Jordan River. It's on the east side of the Jordan River. You see this little city, Tishbe? All right, this is where Elijah was from. They called Elijah the Tishbite because he was from this city right here. This was the birthplace of Elijah, okay? He's from this city. So this is Elijah's stomping grounds, if you would, all right? And so Elijah here, he makes this pronouncement, okay? And so God tells him after he makes this pronouncement to go, and, to go by the brook Cherith. And that's where God's going to take care of him. So this is where this is taking place. Right over here in this area on the east side of the Jordan River. So I just wanted you to see that so that you kind of, this tells some of the different things that Elijah did in the course of his particular uh, ministry, some of the miracles that he had and such what. But just to give you some kind of a locale, a little locator here as to where this is taking place. So let's talk about the pronouncement, okay? The pronouncement. Elijah, the book, the, the pronouncement we see in verses number one and two. It says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew, that's, that's pretty serious, not, not just not rain, but not even dew, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. In other words, when I tell you it's going to rain, it's going to rain. If I don't tell you, it ain't going to rain. Verse number two, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence and turn thee eastward. And so he makes the pronouncement, no rain. And we know from the scriptures it didn't rain for three years. Three years, that's a long time. Can you imagine what it would be like here in Kansas if it didn't rain for three years? Wow, pretty sad situation. Farmers wouldn't have any crops. You know, they might plant them in the ground to start with, but they'd never go anywhere because the crops need water to grow. Trees would dry up. We'd have fires all over the place because of the fact a lightning storm might come through, might not drop down any, you know, rain. Sometimes they'll just have that heat lightning, you know, whatever, and zap, it hits a dry field, catches it on fire, and you get a big fire, burns up a bunch of acreage. That's what happens. Dry, dry conditions. Anything can happen to set things on fire because everything's like kindling wood, you know. Very, very severe conditions. Imagine the impact on an agricultural society. All right? When there's no rain. It's not like we can pump in water from the Colorado River. It's not like we can, you know, get water from some other place close by and bring it by. We're talking about agricultural society. We're talking about a pretty severe condition right here. So everyone was affected. Everyone was affected by this drought. And Elijah made the prediction. So Ahab saw Elijah as the cause for the calamity. Who is the real cause for the calamity? 
Ahab was the cause of the calamity. But who was Ahab blaming for the calamity? He's blaming Elijah for the calamity. Oh, my goodness. He hadn't connected, connected the dots. And I think in many cases in our culture today, people are not connecting the dots. They are blaming all kinds of people. It's amazing how many things our president gets blamed for. Now, believe me, he does some things that brings blame upon himself. But there's certain things that he had nothing to do with, you know what I mean? And everybody wants to blame him for it. Yet so many things we do, we're the ones that bring these problems upon ourselves. And so we see the pronouncement, no rain. Well, then when a pronouncement like that comes, you got to be prepared for the next stage. All right. And that is this, the protection. Look at verse number three. Verse number three says, the Lord, of course, verse number two says, the Lord came to him saying, get thee hence and turn thee eastward and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. So here's God saying, Elijah, you need to hide yourself. Why did God say Elijah need to hide himself? What did they have have in mind? He wanted to kill who? He wanted to kill Elijah. And there's a story that goes before this, you know, where the Obadiah is, you know, he's, uh, you know, hide, he hid the prophets and stuff like that, you know. And uh, Obadiah? No, that's not right. Yeah. And so he hid the 50 prophets in one cave and 50 prophets in the other. And he was feeding them because of the fact that they were killing all the prophets and so on like that, you know. And uh, <coughs> he makes himself known to Obadiah. And he says, uh, tell Ahab, I want to see him. This is later on. He says, oh, he says, he says, you know, he's looked all over the kingdom for you. He says, if, if I tell him that you're over here and then he comes and you're not there, he's going to kill me. He says, we've looked all over the place for you and nobody's been able to find you. He says, if I go and tell him that, who knows, but the Spirit of the Lord might come and take you and bring you someplace else. He was really fearful. But this is how Elijah did, because God had to protect him. You know why? Because you know people, that, you know, it's a funny thing. How many of you have one of those little idiot lights on your dashboard go off? The little lights that say service engine or something like that, a little right, you know, that little red, used to be just a red light that came on, you didn't know what it was. All right, now at least it'll say something to you, even though it's pretty general. All right. You know, some people, what they want to do is they want to smash the little red light because it they just bothers them. But does smashing the little red light on your car fix your problem? No. no. Does killing the prophet who pronounced the judgment that came from God, does that fix your problem? No. The problem is the judgment came for a reason. Curse came for the, because there was a cause. Get the cause fixed and you can get the problem fixed. But people want to kill the, you know, they don't like the message, so they want to kill the messenger. Isn't that so true? You know, that was true back then. Is that any less true today? If you say something that people don't like, they'll, they, will, they want to kill you. You say, well, what kind of sense does that make? It made just about the same amount of sense as it made back here in Elijah's day. Elijah told them what they needed to know. Elijah did what God told him to do. They wanted to kill Elijah. Why didn't they just want to go to God? Because that would have to solve their problem. Then they'd have to fix their problem. They didn't want to do that. We need to fix our problems, but we don't want to fix our problems. So what do we do? Well, we assassinate or we kill the, pro the person who told us we had the problem. And that's a sad state of affairs, but that's precisely what took place back in the time. God knew that, so he says, Elijah, go hide by the brook chair. And so Elijah goes, and God protects him in this way. Ahab wanted to get his hands on Elijah. The problem was not Elijah, it was Ahab. So God hid the prophet. He put him in a place of protection. And then people uh, don't like the message, they harm the messenger. Okay, so the problem was not the light indicating the problem. The problem was under the hood. And that's where all of our problems are, under the hood. Amen? Get the heart fixed, and it takes care of the things that are really wrong with us. Well, then we see something else here. We see the provisions in verse 4 through 6. Okay, because now Elijah is in this desolate place. He's in this place, back someplace, away from everybody. I mean, it was where people were not. Nobody knew where he was. So he was someplace by himself, by the brook chair, someplace. So he had a water source there. And then God did something else for him. Some of you might think, ooh, gross. But hey, look, this is what God did. This is how God fed the prophet. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. No problem. Drinking of a brook sounds like a pretty good thing, especially during a water shortage. And I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, which is before the Jordan. Okay, so 
guess who was his main provider? The ravens. How many have ever seen a raven before? Most of you have. We went to, to Alaska, and we went to Alaska. There was these ravens. Some of the guys are with us. I'm trying to think who was. Uh, Joe was with there, I think. I don't know if you remember. This raven, these, they're pretty good-sized birds. I mean, they're pretty good. Um, we saw this raven, and I'm going to tell you, he was pretty bold. I mean, he was used to people being around him. He was pretty bold. I mean, we were, there was a little fence that, you know, was kind of this little strip mall type thing. It wasn't like much of a mall, but there was a little fence right there. And this raven, poop. I mean, pop right there on the fence. We're standing, we're right here, and the raven's right there. I mean, he's just right there waiting for a french fry. I mean, this guy, he was hungry, and he would just, anything you'd feed this bird, he would eat it. And, uh, but uh, the ravens, uh, just to tell you a little bit about ravens, okay, they're part of the crow family, all right? So if you've seen a crow, you've seen something that looks like a raven. The raven is a larger species in the crow family, and so uh, they are part of the crow family. They're about 21 to 26 inches long. Pretty good sized bird, not your little sparrow guy, okay? 21 to 26 inches long, pretty good sized bird. They have a wingspan of about 45 to 51 inches. So man, when they flap it out there, it's like four foot long. I mean, now this is a pretty good sized bird, all right? And so uh, this raven here, he will eat just about anything. They call them omnivorous. In other words, they will eat, um, they'll eat uh, the green stuff, they'll eat nuts and they'll eat vegetables. They'll eat things that you and I eat. They'll eat gross stuff. They'll, eat, they'll, they'll even eat uh, carrion, which is basically dead animals and stuff like that. He will eat anything. The raven will eat absolutely anything, okay? Not the guy that you necessarily want to come feeding you in the morning and in the evening, okay? But they're very intelligent. One of the most intelligent birds is the raven. He's very smart. Interesting, God chose a smart one. <laughs> You know, God's got all these animals out there, and God chose this bird to take care of his prophet Elijah. And his bird, or birds, okay, he says the ravens, so there was more than one. Uh, maybe they took shifts, I don't know. But uh, this bird, these birds fed Elijah every day for, I don't know how long. We don't know how long. We know that Elijah had no rain for three years. We know he went from here to the, to the widow of Zarephath. But we don't know how long he was here by the brook by himself and how long the ravens fed him. But every morning, every evening, the ravens fed the prophet. And I don't know what they brought him for lunch or before dinner, but uh, it, it, it was probably something we might not have, we might have turned our nose up at it, you know, but it was food. Kept the prophet alive. They can remember their relationship with other ravens for years. I mean, scientists do experiments, you know. They have like, you know, raven A, raven B, and they somehow, you know, they, they label them, you know. And these ravens, after years, will remember these different ravens and somehow, again, very intelligent bird. But something else interesting about the raven, they will mate for life. In other words, once they find a mate, they will mate with that bird for the rest of their life. You say, well, how long is that? Raven will live from 20, from 20 to 40 years. 20 to 40 years. In 20 years, uh, basically, in... Uh, you know, if they take them and put them in, in, uh, uh, out in the wild and 40 years in captivity, they'll live that long. So a raven is quite, uh, quite an interesting bird. bird of God obviously is designed to do this. You know, it just struck me when I was thinking about this as I was reading this. You know, isn't it neat that God controls this part of his creation? You, you know, okay, you think, all right. God's supposed to be able to have some kind of sway over his, the highest part of his creation, which is mankind, right? He's supposed to speak to our hearts. We respond to God. We do what he says, and we're obedient to him. We worship him, and all those kind of things. We sing to him. We, we trust him. But wait a second now. Do you ever think about how many of the animals will do precisely what God says? I mean, God put it in the mind, however you want to put it, all right, in the brain of these birds to feed this prophet at this brook every morning and every evening for however long it took for these birds to do this. And these birds obeyed God every time. You know something? You know, and, and you think about when God sent the hornets after the armies, you know, that they chased in, in Canaan. How did the hornets know to chase those guys and not these guys? In other words, how did the hornets know to chase the Canaanites and not the Israelites? How did the hornets know that? I mean, did they have, did they understand the uniform thing? Did, you know, I don't know how, how can God orchestrate even the animal kingdom? I mean, just think about Noah back in the days of Noah, all right? 
God told the animals to come to the ark. Noah didn't round them up. God sent them. He sent them two by two. He sent seven of the clean animals and two by two of the unclean. Isn't that amazing that God put them all on the ark at the right time that God spoke to these critters? How about when the plagues took place back in, in Moses' day? How that the locusts and the lice and the flies and the frogs and the snakes, I mean, all the things that took place during the plagues, that God had that kind of control over the animals. You know, it just makes you wonder. You know, we, we think about God having the ability to know what's going on in the lives of billions of people, but do you know how many critters there are on planet Earth? I mean, we're talking about bugs and birds and animals and things like that. And God has the ability to orchestrate what's going on even in nature. Not to mention the winds and the waves and the temperatures and all the climactic things that are taking place in our lives. Isn't it amazing that God has this kind of sway over all of this part of the creation? So here is, here is his prophet who is in danger, or could possibly be in danger, obviously would be if Ahab could get his hands on him, sends Elijah out there to a place where he is all by himself and sends these birds to feed his prophets. I just say, don't we serve an amazing God when you think about this particular part of it? Sends the birds. Well, one more thing right here, and that is not only the provision, we see the pronouncement, Ahab, I should say Elijah, makes the pronouncement. This is what God told him to pronounce. We see the protection. God makes provisions for his uh, a prophet as well. So he is fed during this time. Then we see the predicament. The predicament we see in verse number 7. Verse number 7, what happens? Okay, again, we don't know exactly how long he was out there. Could be a year, could be two years. We don't know. But we knew it was for quite a time until he got to the widow of Zarephath. But nonetheless, it says in verse number 7, and it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up. The brook dried up. You say, well, why did the brook dry up? Because that was God's plan. The brook dried up. Remember we talked about last week, sometimes when we are in the boat with somebody who made a choice that we didn't make, that we have to go through it with them. Do you know this is just another illustration of that same principle? Because the drought came upon all these people. But Elijah was one of those people who had a constant source of water up to this point. He was always able to have water somehow. A lot of people were not. Things dried up. Elijah was taken care of. But then it came to a time where Elijah had to experience the consequences of his own prediction or pronouncement. Ouch. Ouch. You know, it's one thing to get up there and say, Thus saith the Lord, thou shalt experience thus and so. <laughs> but then you have to experience it too. And you've got to suffer the consequences of what's going on also. Elijah had to suffer the consequences as well. The brook dried up. Now, when I think about that, I think about, okay, it would have been real tempting. Because remember what Elijah said? He said there in verse number one, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. That's what Elijah said. Would it have been tempting to say, Okay, I've had enough of this. Time to rain. be very frank with you, it would have been pretty presumptuous. Whose power held the rain back? Whose? That's exactly right. We have to keep this in perspective. Elijah might have been a mouthpiece, but God was the power behind what took place. You see? Elijah was not the one that was conducting the judgment of the process that was trying to bring it. God was doing it. He used his prophet to voice the message. But it was God's power that held the rain back. And it will be, in the, as you read on into other verses here, it'll be God's power that brings the rain again.
Remember Elijah on top of Mount Carmel? He had to pray seven times before he saw a cloud. Okay? It's the power of God, though. It's the power of God. We talk about the power of Elisha. But Elisha, I should Elijah. Elijah was a faithful prophet of the Lord. It would have been real tempting to say, I want it to rain now. Would have been a little presumptuous, though. God had to bring him through some of the same difficulties that the rest of the people were experiencing. And so he, too, had to wait for the Lord's timing. How many of you are just about done with this COVID thing? Uh, you're just done with it. It's okay, you can stop this now. All right, how many of you are just about done with the rioting and all the foolishness that's going on as a result? You know, I, I feel bad for, you know, okay, oh, wait, injustice, Mr. Floyd, injustice. But okay, all right. Uh, have we destroyed enough businesses, enough cities? Have we destroyed enough people and, and destroyed enough property and killed enough people? I mean, is, is, is that, are we done enough now? I mean, I think we, we feel like, okay, we're done with this stuff. But, um, but are we? Have people returned to God yet? Has there been repentance? Has there been revival? Have the people turned their hearts back to God? Do we see more of people return to God? Well, you know, we did see something the other day that was good. There was a march of people that were actually praying and, uh, and seeking the Lord and some things. Of course, you know, the news is not going to show that. But, um, but you know what? I guess I should have one more statement here, and that is the patience. The patience. Because even Elijah had to wait for God to say it's time. And so do we. We have to wait until God is ready to deliver, ready to make a change in whatever is going to take place. We're done with that. I mean, we're saying, okay, I've had enough of this. But we're like Elijah by the brook. The brook's dried up and we're a little tired of a bird food. But maybe we need to get more tired and pray more. Maybe our prayers need to get more desperate. I would reckon Elijah's prayers got a little desperate when the brook dried up. Lord, the, the brook's dry. What, what am I supposed to do now? He ended up being fed by a widow who thought she was gathering the last bit of meal so her and her son could die. That's where he's destined to go to next. Yet God's teaching the prophet at the same time God's judging the people, you see. And God's going to teach the church at the same time that God is bringing these things upon some of the wickednesses that we see in our culture. And so we have to have patience because we're going through it too. And it'd um, be nice if we could just say, okay, just wave the wand and it's all over. I'm done with this. <laughs> The book dried up. We have to wait too. Well, let's go back to prayer. We've got some more things on the list. People have needs. Let's bring these needs before the Lord.